فهي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مدد له ومن يدد فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليم كثيرا أما بعض إن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد We began the explanation of the 40 Hadith of an Imam al in our previous class and we dealt with a lot of issues concerning the muqaddimat of the Hadith, those things that come before actually explaining the Hadith and the last thing that we left off in the last presentation was the value and the weight concern, the consideration that the ulama of the Islam gave to this particular Hadith as we mentioned, an Imam al Nawi, Rahmatullah Ta'ala, alayhi put in the 40 hadith what is from the Jawami al Kenya, those heavy statements that the Prophet mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the words that he mentioned that had far reaching implications, many ahkam, many rules, many regulations, many benefits, as the great scholar, the Imam. Abu Ubaid Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi said about this particular hadith that when you look at the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there is no hadith that is arfa, higher in its meaning no hadith that is afna no hadith that is anfa no hadith that is akthar fa'ida and this hadith has the most benefit out of all of the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we mentioned Quoting very briefly how those ulama passed, they looked at this hadith like the statement of an Imam Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, one of those tremendous ulama of al hadith in the past. He said that if anyone was going to write a book, every chapter of that book should begin with this hadith, إنما الأعمال بالنيات. So if you write a book in English, in Arabic, in Urdu, in Swahili, then the beginning of the book should be starting off with this hadith in chapter 2, in chapter 3, in chapter 4 as a way of reminding the writer, the author, as well as those who are reading the book or listening to the book being read or explained that they would know the importance of purifying the niyyah. Purifying the niyyah. Tremendous scholar of Islam and the Imam al-Khattabi, he mentioned, and he was one of those ulama who explain the ahadith of al-imam muslim, sahih muslim. So a number of hadith, number of scholars explain sahih muslim. From them an imam al nawi but another man is al-imam al-khattabi, one of the great scholars of al-islam from the shafi'iyah. He had mentioned that the mutaqaddimun, those scholars before him, they used to have istihsan, they used to say that this hadith is one of those hadith that people should always begin whatever action they're going to begin with with this hadith in mind, with this hadith in mind. Also, a funny from what the scholars of Al-Islam mentioned about the importance of this hadith and really, if the average Muslim only put weight on this hadith, we would know that it's important in fiqh, it's important in aqidah. If a Muslim understood this hadith, when it comes to the issue of making takfir, and branding a Muslim as being a kafir because of something he did, something he said. If a person understood this hadith, he would be reluctant, he would be slow, he would be afraid to just say someone's a kafir without giving some weight and some consideration to his niyyah, the thing that he did, the thing that he said, that may be kufr or described as kufr. But what was his niyyah? Inna man a'malu biniyat. So a lot of people rule and judge other people would take fear or give them a ruling that's unfair. Someone said in describing the Quran, he likes Surah Yasin. So he says Surah Yasin is a wicked surah. It's a wicked surah. That is a bad surah. The Quran is a bad book. That's a tough book. 
What he meant in his miyat was to describe Surah to Yasin as wicked in the colloquial language of the street, of the people. That is, that is a real serious surah. Now, I don't think you should describe Surah Yasin or any surah of the Quran with wicked or bad or tough. But what was his niyyat? He didn't mean that the Quran was wicked. So as a result of that statement and that description, the person says, you describe the kalam of Allah as being wicked? He says, no man, slow down. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْنِيَّاتِ It's not from adab to do that, to say that, but that wasn't my intent. So some people have no knowledge of this religion. They just judge people for what they do. And they bring the judgments that are wrong. He's learning the Quran, reading the Quran, month of Ramadan. And he puts the Quran on the floor while he's sitting on the floor. And he's reading from the Quran. And someone comes and says, you're disrespecting the kalam of Allah. You put the Quran on the floor of disrespect. That's kufr. Because anyone who takes the ayat of Allah for just in plain disrespects them, Allah said that that's kufr. He said, hey, that's not maniyah. So this hadith is a tremendous hadith in the religion of Al-Islam. So how tremendous is it? Again, those scholars of the past, they used to start their books off with this hadith, like I mentioned to you. Most authentic book on the face of the earth. After the Quran, Sahih Bukhari. He brought this hadith to start his book off, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. Many of those scholars, and Imam al Babu, his book, Masabih as Sunnah, his other book, Shah as Sunnah, started both of those books off with this hadith. And Imam Abdul Ghani and Maqtasi started the book, Umdatul Ahkam, with this hadith. And Imam al Suyuti, his book, Al Jami al Sagir, started it off with this hadith. And Imam al Nawi, whose book we're dealing with, he started 40 hadith with this hadith. He started, he started off Al Majmu' with this hadith. Riyadh al Salihin with this hadith. So the scholars of Islam used to put this hadith in a special place. In addition, some of the ulama of Islam, they said this hadith represents half of this whole religion. Half of the whole religion. It is Nusfuddin. How is it half of the religion? Because for your deed to be accepted in Al-Islam, you have to have two conditions. We just prayed Salat al-Asr, Salat al-Dhuhr. Allah will accept that from us if we fulfill two conditions. Ramadan is coming. Allah is going to accept the Ramadan and the efforts if two conditions are felt are fulfilled. If one of these two are not there, then that thing is going to be thrown back at you and won't give you any reward. Yom al One condition is you have to have a niyyat that is only for Allah. I'm fasting only for Allah. That's why fasting is so meritous in the religion. Because it's the only ibadah from the ibadah in Al-Islam is between you and Allah. Nobody knows if you're fasting or you're not fasting. 15 year old kid goes to school, 13, 14 year old kid goes to school. We don't know what they're doing while they're in school. You don't know if your wife is fasting. She doesn't know if you're fasting. And that's why Allah said in the hadith of Qudsi, إِنَّ الصَّوْمْ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِي بِي Psalm is for me, and I'm the one who will reward it. Because only Allah knows if you're fasting. So the deed has to have ikhlas. Al-Nabi, he does a deed that doesn't have ikhlas, it'll be rejected. And this hadith proves that. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ if you make hijrah for Allah's Messenger, Salat for Allah, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you did any ibadah, then you get rewarded. And then the second condition is another hadith that an Imam Noah we brought, and that is that the deed and the action has to be done in accordance to the Sunnah. The hadith said, Men amina amina laysa amruna rad. Anyone who does an action that's not from our religion, it will be rejected. So this hadith. Scholars said half of the religion. Some of the ulama said that there are hadith that represent a third of the religion. They bring three hadith added on to that. Verily, the halal is clear and the haram is clear. And other than that, point is, those scholars of Islam of the opinion that this particular hadith, Ikhwani, one of the most important hadith in the religion of Al Islam. Now, as it relates to the meaning of the hadith, the Prophet, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Verily, the deeds will be judged by the intention, and the person will get that which he intended. So anyone who performed hijrah, then 
and his hatred for, was for Allah and his messenger, then his reward would be the same way. And hijra, one of those words that we should know, we should have a concept of it, we should comprehend it, has a lot of fiqh connected to it. Unfortunately, you have two extremes. You have those people who are too rough and tough as it relates to hijra, and they pass rulings telling people they must make hijra, and they don't know what they're talking about. And you have the other people who look at hijra as being insignificant. He made hijra, and he came to Dar al Kufr, and he's losing his children, and he has the nerve and the audacity to come and say, no, this hijra is not important, no, the issue is not a serious issue. He lost his kids, and he has the nerve to say that. So, two meanings of an hijra. One is the wider, broader meaning. The wider, broader meaning of hijra is to abandon something, to leave something. For an example, in Ramadan, you're going to make hijra from your food and drink and your desires during the daytime. And hijra means a turk, to abandon, to leave something. If you have a Muslim brother, you have a misunderstanding with him, or you have a misunderstanding with your wife, and you abandon her, and you stop talking to that individual, you cut off the ties of relationship with your family, that is an hij an hijr, that's a form of hijr, to abandon something. That's the broader, wider meaning. So everybody here is making hijra about something. But we have to have fiqh about how to make hijra. He says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Concerning this broader, wider meaning of an hijra, he said, "Al mujahidu man jahad nafsuhu fi dhatillah, wal muhajir man taraka ma naha Allahu anhu." He said, "The one who makes jihad is the one who makes jihad against his nafs, his own self, as it relates to obeying Allah. He gets up and he prays. She's patient with her husband. He's patient with his wife and his children. He makes." Jihad in order to lower the gaze. He's making jihad keep his mouth under control to make jihad and efforts. Prophet Muhammad said anybody who does that is a mujahid. Not just the one who goes and he wages war, defends Islam, spreads Islam. Not just him. There's a wider meaning. Anyone who makes jihad against his nafs, he's a mujahid. And anyone who abandons what Allah prohibited him from is a muhajir. So if you leave off something that's haram, looking at what's haram, saying what's haram, doing what's haram, then you are muhajir. That's the wider, broader meaning. And then we have the specific religious meaning, the meaning of this hadith, this hadith. And that is where a person does one of two things. He's living in a place of khawf, fear. He's afraid. It's a place with that's hostile and he's trying to practice his religion so he leaves that place of al-khawf and then he goes to another place where there is an amin there's safety and security there's amin and there's a salam and istiqrar that's a hijra to leave one place where you're afraid like the prophet was in mecca sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he couldn't practice islam and he was afraid and his companions were afraid and they were getting killed so some of them left Mecca and they went to Al Habasha, Abyssinia, Ethiopia. So they went from a place, Bilad al Khuf, to the Bilad of Al Amin. That's one type of hijra that a Muslim can make. Second type of hijra is, again, the hijra that the Prophet Muhammad made, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When a person leaves the Bilad of Al Kufr, he leaves the land of Al Kufr. And he goes to the land of Al-Islam. So he was in Mecca, which at, at that time was from the lands of Al-Kufr. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went to Al-Medina, which became Darul Islam. That's the hijra as it relates to migration. There is no such thing, there is no such thing, there is no such thing other than these two. Now it's possible that a Muslim can be in the dar of al-Islam, he's in the place of Islam, but there's fear there, he's not safe, like in Syria right now, the Muslim is going to be hijra from that place, it's dar al-Islam, but there's no safety there, so he comes to the UK, he goes to America, did he make hijra from dar al-Islam to dar al-Kufr, you could say that, but what was his niyyah, 
His niyyah was to go from the place of al-khawf and fear to the place of safety, providing as the ability to worship his Lord, to practice his religion. If he can't practice his religion, he can't do it. Ikhwani, there are a lot of virtues in al hijrah And it is a serious issue, and people need to think about it, and people need to consider it, and people need to be ready to make the decisions. Will you ever make an hijrah Go to a place where you have the ability to practice your religion. Allah Ta'ala did you mean the ayat of the Qur'an. In the ladina tawafahum al malaika tu vanimi and fusihim. Kalu, fima kuntu, kalu kunna mustadafina from ar. Kalu alam takun ardu lahi wa si atim for tu haji mufiha, for ula ikama wa hum jahannam wa sa at masira. Those people who the malaika come to them at death, and the malaika will say to them, what was your condition in the earth? What was your condition? You didn't pray, you didn't hijab, you were doing haram, everything about your life was a life that was far from Islam. What did you have to say about your condition? The person would say, we were weak and we were oppressed in the land. We didn't have any power. We didn't have any messages. The people were against me. I was afraid to wear hijab. I was afraid to pray. I was afraid to do juma. I was weak and I oppressed. I couldn't do anything. The malakik will say, wasn't Allah's earth spacious so that you could have made hijrah to it? Because you've been created to worship Allah. So wasn't Allah spacious? His earth spacious? You could have made hijrah to worship Allah? Those people, their resting place, their abode will be the Jahannam and what an evil resting place. So if you were to look at the hijrah, there are a lot of ayat of the Quran. He said about it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ana bari'un min kulli Muslim. I am free from every Muslim who lives with the Mushrikeen. That's hadith of the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. One of the companions, his name is Am ibn al-As, one of the important personalities in Jahiliya. In al Medina, when he wanted to embrace al-Islam, the Prophet was convincing him about Al-Islam. He said, okay, Muhammad, I'll, I'll accept under Al-Islam under the condition that Allah forgives me for all of what I've done. Because he did a lot. The Prophet said to that man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Nabi Aradan Yashtarat Allah, Qala lahu, Ama alimt anna al-hijrata tahdimu ma kana qabluha wa anna al-islama yahdimu ma kana qabluha don't you know that if you make hijrah, hijrah will wipe away everything that went before it. And if you accept Islam, Islam wipes away everything that you did before it. And if you perform hajj correctly, hajj will wipe away everything that you did before it. So you don't have to make a condition, Ya Amr ibn al-Az, that Allah forgives you. If you become a Muslim, no matter what you were doing in Jahiliya, no matter how many people you harm, you hurt, no matter what money you took, then Al-Islam, it wipes that away. So Hijrah is a mukaf for what happened in the past. Hijrah, Islam, as well as Al-Hajj. As it relates to the virtues of Al-Hijrah, this is really important, Ikhwan. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam along with the other four major prophets, Noah, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, Muhammad, they're the five major messengers. Their stories are bigger than the stories of everyone else in the Quran. They are heavier in the Mizan with Allah than the other prophets, and they're all important. But these five, Noah, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, Muhammad, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in, all of them made some type of hijrah. All of them made some type of hijrah. So this concept of Leaving the place where you were born, where you were raised, the place that you're used to, and going somewhere else to practice your religion because you couldn't do it in your homeland, your motherland, that's beloved to everybody. Everybody's natural is in the fitrah to love where you came from, like me. I love America. America is a beautiful country, the landscape. I just don't like the government. Government doesn't represent me. But the country itself, California, Florida, Arizona, New York. It's a beautiful place if you go there. Summertime or wintertime. That's the fitrah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
when he went from Medina to Mecca and he conquered Mecca after all of those years from being away. When he conquered Mecca, it was time to go back to Al Medina. Some of the people were nervous. The people from Al Medina, people in Medina, was, they were nervous, thinking that the Prophet ﷺ was going to stay in Mecca. Rasulullah said, No, I'm not going to stay in Mecca. I'm going back with you, the Ansar. So he chose to die as a Muhajir. He could have stayed in Mecca because he loved that country. When he came to Mecca and he conquered Mecca, he was with Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And they were just marveling at how Mecca had changed and what it looked like. They missed Mecca. He told Abu Bakr, had it not been for the fact that your people put me out, I would have never left Mecca. He yearned to smell the grass of Mecca. You know, some of our people, the lady is pregnant, she has a baby, has a baby. Where she comes from, when she's pregnant, some women eat the dirt from the land that they came from. And it tastes good. I'm not telling anybody to do that. You know, when a woman is pregnant, she eat chalk, she eat cheese, she want this, she want that. I know some women eat the dirt from where they come from. So everybody, nobody in his right mind, where you come from, Tanzania, you love your country? No, I don't love my country. What are you talking about? Something happened wrong. Something happened wrong. Because the fitra is to love where you came from. The Nabi, you sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, loved Mecca. And Mecca is more virtuous than Medina. The reward in Mecca, more than the reward of Medina. And yet, what did he choose? He chose to go back to Al Medina and he died as a muhajir. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Nuh built a boat, got on that boat and rode away from where he came from. Ibrahim was traveling, making hijrah all over the place. From an Iraq to Egypt, from Egypt to Palestine. Musa with Ben Israel, they left Egypt with Fir'aun, traveling and looking for the promised land. Isa ibn Maryam, when he comes back, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi ajma'in. When he comes back, he's going to make hijra from Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Because he won't have the ability to fight them. So he's, one, he's not going to confront them. He's going to kill the Dajjal. But when Ya'juj and Ma'juj come on the scene, Isa ibn Maryam is going the other way with the believers. All of those indications of the importance of al hijra So an individual should never, never... Look at this as being a small issue. You lost your children. They don't know your language. They come here, they don't even know the language. The kid is an Arabic kid. He, he doesn't know three words, three sentences in Arabic. He lost his kid. They lost their akhlaq. They lost their adab. Come here, in, in his country, he would have never thought about addressing his father, addressing his father's brother by their first names. Come here, the kid says to his dad, Yo dad, what's up? Yo dad, what's up? And this is acceptable. And he says, this is a small thing. Hijra is a big thing in Al-Islam. So, we should all think about it. But on the other side, the person should be mushetted. He shouldn't take those ahadith. I'm free from the one who lives with the mushrikeen. And he said, we all have to leave. Where, where are we going? Well, where, where are you going? I'm, you want me? I'm going to Mecca and Medina? Who's going to give me that visa? I have to go to Syria? I have to go somewhere in, 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 I have to go somewhere in the world where the standard of living is much lower than what I'm used to and what I know? Education, much lower. Wait, what are you talking about? So don't be shadeed. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived in Mecca, the place of the Kaaba, and he left that place to practice his religion. So if a person is in a situation where he can't practice his religion, then he has to make hijra, his wajib, and he's sinning if he doesn't. But if a person can practice his religion, he can dress as a Muslim, he does his five prayers, he fasts the month of Ramadan, he makes the adhan, he does the aid, he gets married, his child is named with the children name, he gets the khitan or the circumcision, all of those things, then it's permissible for him to live in the land where the people are not necessarily Muslims. So take it easy. Take it easy with both extremes. There is a reason, Ikhwani, that's pretty important as to why this hadith was mentioned. Some of the ulama, they said that this hadith was mentioned because of an incident involving a companion who the companions gave him the nickname Muhajir Ummi Qais. They called him Muhajir Ummi Qais. Now this is important because if you want to know and understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah correctly, 
then there is a science that is called Asbab al-Nazul. Asbab al-Nazul. Why was the reveal? Why was the ayat revealed? Why did the prophet say this? Why did the prophet do that? If you know the reason and the context, you'll get the correct understanding. And this is from the fundamental and basic aspects of this religion. And that's why we reject the notion and the claims of the kuffar or anyone. They're unjust. When they come and talk about our religion and they speak about issues out of context, speak about it in the context so that you'll be fair and just. If you don't know the context, there's a problem. Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, فَقْتُلُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ هَيْثُ وَجَدْتَمُوهُمْ Kill and slay the polytheists, wherever you find them. So I take that ayat out of context. And I take that ayat, I go out, and I just kill the next taxi driver who's a Sikh. And I say, Allah told me to do that. No, that's not the context. That ayat was revealed for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Slay the mushrikeen wherever you find them. Why did it say wherever you find them? Because the ayat is talking about even if in, they're in the sacred precincts of Mecca because now they've transgressed, they're, they have transgressed. And in Mecca you can't fight in the sacred precincts. But it's okay. Kill them, fight them in the sacred monk. Fight them in the sacred area. Wherever you find them, whenever you find them. So if a person doesn't understand that context, who will come and say Al-Islam just allow people to murder people indiscriminately. So if you understand why something was said, Qulu Allahu Ahl, Allahu Sana. Okay, you know the ayah. Why was it revealed? The Kufav Quraysh, they say, hey, Muhammad, tell us, what is your God made out of? You can see our gods. they made out of brass, iron, copper, dates. This one is made out of wood. What is your God, Allah? What is he made out of? This guy you're calling us to. Worship Allah. Ibudullah. What, who, what is he made out of? Rasulullah didn't say anything. Jibril brought this surah. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulid. Wa lam yakul lahu kufu wa ahad. That was revealed for that reason. Qul ya ayyu al kafirun. We worship Allah one year and you worship our gods one year. Qul ya ayyu al kafirun. If you understand why, you'll understand how to apply it better. Many of the people who said, Hijra is wajib. Here's a hadith that says, Rasulullah is free from every Muslim that lives with the mushrikeen. Hijra is wajib on everyone. Understand that context. That context is, after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Hijra from Mecca, and all of the Muslims wound up in al Medina. And then Medina became the bedrock of Al Islam. He told his companions, I'm free from any Muslim who doesn't choose to live here with us at this time. So if the Muslim is in the desert or somewhere over here, wherever we're there, they have to make Hijrah and move here. If they don't, I'm free of you. So if the non Muslims kill you or something happened, don't expect me to come and help you because you should have come here with us. And that's why he said, La hijra al fatr. There's no hijra after Mecca has been conquered. So once he conquered Mecca, now you don't have to make hijra to Al Medina. You don't have to make hijra to Medina. You can go to Mecca, you can stay wherever you want. So you have to understand the context. Some of the scholars said that the context of this hadith, إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته إلى فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته إلى الدنيا ليصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه. They said that there was a man from the companions. He loved this lady in Jahiliya. And then they both became Muslims and they were from Mecca. The lady, she made hijra from Mecca to Al Medina and she left everything behind. Hijra. You're going to leave your house, you're going to leave your wealth, you're going to leave your relatives, you're going to leave everything that's important to you, your job, you're going to a new place to start brand spanking new for your religion. So that lady left and she did that. And that man, that man, he remained in Mecca and he wanted her to come back, come, come, and we're going to hook up and get married. She said, no, 
Her name was Um Qais. No, 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 I'm not coming back. If you want to marry me and get hooked up with me, you got to come here to Al Medina. So he made Hijrah. So they said that this hadith, the Prophet addressed that. Whoever's Hijrah was for Allah and his messenger, like Rasulullah's Hijrah was, like Abu Bakr's Hijrah was, like Uthman, Umar, Ali, the Hijrah was for Allah and his messenger. They left everything, they left at night, they didn't take with them, they just left. Ultimate sacrifice. And that's why you'll see Hijrah being mentioned with jihad all the time. Jihad is the ultimate sacrifice. You're going to lose your life. You can lose your life. And if you lose your life, your children are going to be orphans. Your wife is going to be a widow. Hatred is like that. Tremendous sacrifice. Nobody in his right mind, if someone came and said, Hey guys, we got to roll out of Bedford right now. You got like 30 minutes to get home, get what you want and get and let's get out of here. It's going to be hard. What are you going to take? Our kids are going to take the PlayStation. They're going to take uh, things like that. The mother says, no, no, take the Mus'haf, take the Mus'haf. He said, no, I'm going to take the PlayStation. This is the most important thing to me. You see? What are you going to take? Those companions, they left everything. Their money and everything. And Hijra, he said, he did that. So that lady, on base, that man made Hijra for her. So a lot of the ulama who explain this hadith, they always mention that. But in reality, with all of the searching, with all of the searching, there seems to be some truth to that incident, that there was a lady that was like that. But it's not clear that the Prophet said this hadith because of that. It's not clear. But whether it is clear or whether it is true or it's not true, the point is you get the picture that you have to make hijra or you have to do any ibadah with the goal and the objective of pleasing Allah Azza wa As it relates ikhwani, to the benefits of the hadith, there are many, many benefits of this hadith. We know that there are five ahkam in al-Islam, five ahkam, fiqhiyah, about everything. Something is halal, or something is haram, something is mustahab, is highly recommended, or something is makruh, is dislike, or something is mubah. So haram, halal is the thing that you can do, it's good, it's okay. Or, or wajib, wajib, you have to do it. Or something is haram, you, you can't do that. You can't do it. Or something is mustahab. It's highly recommended that you do this. But if you don't do it, you're not sinning. You're not sinning. Or something is makro. It's something that's disliked to do this particular thing. But it's not haram. Like sitting with your feet towards the qibla. You sit. It's not haram. Like me sitting like this towards you. It's not dis it's disrespect. Especially if I have dirty socks on or holy socks on, and smelly socks on, and everybody's culture, it's disrespect. And number five, the thing that's mubah, the thing that's mubah, something that's mubah, mubah is, do it, you don't get any reward, don't do it, you're not sinning. Like what you're wearing right now is mubah, do it, no reward, no reward, the way you're sitting, do it, no reward, and there's no sin. It's no problem. You want that phone? No problem. Want this phone? No problem. One of the benefits of this hadith is it goes to show that the mundane things that are mubah, they can become things that get you close to Allah with your niya. This hadith shows the niya is more profound than the action. The niya is heavier, it's more profound. Then the action. Because if a person has the niyyah to do a particular thing and he doesn't do it, he'll still get the reward for it. Even though he didn't do it. But because of the niyyah being present, he'll get the reward. And there are many hadith. He mentions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La hasada illa fitnatain. It's not permissible to be envious except in two circumstances. You know, and hasad, this marud, it's a sickness. That's in every masjid. It's in every community. People are jealous of other people because of what Allah has given them. It's a sickness. He looks stronger. He has more money. He is brighter. His children, his wife is nicer. He lives in a nicer house. As a result of that, people hate other people, even from their own relatives. Like what happened with Yusuf and his brothers. Yusuf's brothers 
were upset with Yosef and their father, who was a Nebi and Rousseau, simply because the father loved Yusuf more than them. And why did the father love Yusuf more than them? Because of his akhlaq. Because of his behavior. Not because his father Yaqub was unfair and unjust. Point is, the brothers were envious and jealous. They said, how can our father love him? And we have more, we're more than him. We're more than Yusuf and his brother. How? We're more in number, we're stronger. He's left. He loves you more because Allah Azrael gave him characters and gave you. Iblis, he was Hassan against Adam. Why I gotta bow down to him? Why? Allah created me from the knob, created him from the dirt. Hassan. Everybody has to deal with this issue of Hassan. So he said, it's not permissible, permissible to be Hassan except in two situations. A man, you see that Allah gave him money. فَأَنْفَقَهُ عَلَى هَلَكَتِهِ رَجُلًا آتَاهُ اللَّهُ مَالًا فَأَنْفَقَهُ عَلَى هَلَكَتِهِ A man that Allah gave money and he spends that money the right way. So one who doesn't have money says, Oh, if I had money like him, I would do like him. You could be jealous of him. If I had money like him, I would do like him. Just because he had that niyyah, he didn't have the money to do it. Not to mention, he didn't do it at all. And yet, if that was his niyyah, he'll get rewarded. Second, the man who Allah gave him knowledge, or gave him the Qur'an, so he reads the Qur'an during the night and the day, or he works by his knowledge, and he teaches his knowledge. So that person says, man, if I had knowledge the way he had knowledge, I would do like him. I would teach, I would read. And the person doesn't have knowledge, but he made the niyyah. So he'll get the reward. So one of the benefits of the niyyah, this hadith, shows that the niyyah is more profound than the action itself. More profound. And also, the niyyah can make something that's mubah, mundane. You don't get any reward for wearing this color at all. But if your niyyah is Rasulullah like this color, Rasulullah ate this thing, Rasulullah loved the color green. So he wore the color green. Rasulullah used to love the shoulder of the animal, the meat. He loved the shoulder. So I love the shoulder. Rasulullah used to love وسلم, the qara. It's like a pumpkin. A pumpkin. Some food would be put in front of him. It would have the marak, like some uh, gravy. And have some meat. And it had the pumpkin, the dubba. Rasulullah would just eat the dubba. So his companion, Anas ibn Malik, said, when I used to eat with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would break off the dubba, the pumpkin, and put it in front of him. Out of respect for the sheikh, out of respect for the elder, out of respect for the guest. He said, I would put it. But the Rasul used to love that. Anas ibn Malik said, I used to love this Dubba just because the Prophet ate it. That's all. I, I didn't really like it. I didn't care for it particularly, but because Rasulullah liked it, I liked it. So eating the pumpkin is no religious issue, but I'm eating this pumpkin because Rasul liked that pumpkin. So I like he liked it. So it's something Mubah, mundane. It becomes something that will get you close to Allah. And this is from the Rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jalla. He mentioned to one of his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ كَلَنْ تُنْفِقُ نَفَقَةً تَبْتَغِي بِهَا وَجْحَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى إِلَّا أُجِرْتَ عَلَيْهَا حَتَّى لُخْمَةَ الطَّعَامِ تَجْعَلَهَا فِي فَمِ امْرَأَةٍ He said, you will never spend any nafaqa. You never spend anything looking for Allah's good pleasure. Anything looking for Allah's good pleasure. Except you'll be rewarded for it. Even, even, Putting food in your wife's mouth. That can mean two things. Putting food in your wife's mouth. You pay for the food. You pay for it. So you're responsible for the food in the house. So when your wife eats any meal. That you're responsible for. You get rewarded. If you go out and work. And your need is I'm working to get this reward. So when she gets the food and she eats it. Your children eat it. And they put it in their mouth. You get the reward. In your sleep. You're traveling. You're not thinking about it. The hadith can also mean that the man is a romantic man. He's a loving man. 
He's not like, you know, the old school in the country where we come to found. You know what I'm talking about. Crow Magnon man, <laughs> cave man, got the lady by her hair and drag her, like that. He doesn't have any style, any sophistication. He gets married to her for the first night, he's caveman. He doesn't take into consideration Muamala, that the woman is like the Prophet says also to his companion Anjesha. Anjesha was the man who would ride in front of the camels and there are 300, 400, 500 camels behind him in the caravan and his job was just to do the pace. So he would do sounds so that the camels would run according to his sounds mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or whatever he would do. If he did it fast, they would start picking up the pace. If he did it slow, they would slow down the pace. He was traveling with Rasulullah going real fast. His name is Ain Jesha. Ain, Ain Jesha. And it was going fast. Rasulullah noticed it was going fast and he had his wives with him. He put his head out and he said, Rifqan bil qawarir ya Ain Jesha. Hey, Ain Jesha. Take it easy with the bottles. The bottles. So if you can imagine like those... Pepsi bottles, Coca-Cola bottles, you know the skinny ones, the tall ones, or the milk bottles, and they're in the crate, and you're traveling with them real hard like that. What's going to happen to the bottles? Anybody know? Huh? They're going to make a lot of noise, and they're going to eventually break. So he's telling them, take it easy. These women are like the bottles. Don't break up with that, Muhammad. Take it easy. Anyway, he told us that if a man physically puts food in his wife's mouth, and that's with Muda'aba. Muda'aba, he's playing with his wife. He takes the food physically. And usually, Akramakumullah. Usually that's going to happen. That's going to happen when the person is playing with his wife. You know, just being easy. But he'll get a reward. Just because his meal was, I'm feeding my wife to get close to Allah. Hey, even more, even more amazing than that. Rasulullah was telling the people, what is a sadaqa? He said, if you smile, it's a sadaqah. If you give salams, it's a sadaqah. You open the door, it's a sadaqah. And he started mentioning all these things. If you help someone on his horse, sadaqah. He's mentioning all these things. And then he said, وَفِي بُدْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ sadaqah." He says, when one of you have relationships with your wife, that is a sadaqah. When you have normal relationships, shahwa. They found it strange. Ya Rasulullah. If one of us came to relieve himself with a shawa, he gets a reward. He said, don't you see, if he put it in the wrong place, in haram, he'll be sinning, he'll get the wizard, he'll be responsible. They say, yes. He said, well, if he does it with the right person, he'll get rewarded. So just having relationships is a sadaqah. It's mundane. Especially if he chooses to have a relationship on Thursday night, Thursday after Maghrib, before Salat al Juma. He specifically makes that the day. His wife makes that the day, Thursday night. Because anyone who causes someone else to make ghusl and uh, ready for Juma, there's reward. On that day, that night, after Maghrib Thursday, up until uh, the Salat al Juma. So that's from the benefits of Khwari. Also from the benefits of this tremendous hadith is that the Prophet was a tremendous teacher, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and in his teaching method was what the ulama called darb al-amthal, darb al-amthal, where he gave examples to make a point. He gives an example to make a point. The example of the one who gets rewarded by Allah Azawajal with a pure niyyah is like the one who made hijrah with a pure niyyah. An example of the one who doesn't get the reward from, from Allah uh, because of a bad niyyah is the one who made hijrah because of a bad niyyah. So this is from the good teaching methods. So when you talk to people, your children, your wives, and you're trying to make points, get people to understand what the point is, then giving them examples that are relevant and pertinent to what they understand about their culture and their circumstances and what's going on, this is from what the Prophet used to do, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Now that Ramadan is coming, I want to remind you brothers of how this issue of the thing being mubah,
can be turned into something that is a great reward because of your near. So the person who gets up in the morning, normally he feels, I don't really have to get up because it's early. I could just, you know, skip Sahur. But because the Prophet said, take the Sahur, I'm going to take the Sahur. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Especially when there was not a long time to fast, hours. Some people can fast without eating. They don't even need to eat Sahur. But his near is, you know, I know I can get up, I can skip so hard and just stay in the bed, and then I have an hour more to fat to, to sleep before I get up. Or an hour and a half, because Fajr doesn't go out yet. So he doesn't get up for Sahur. But he says, No, I'm gonna get up for Sahur because that's the Sunnah. The Prophet mentioned Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Sahur for in the Sahur Barakatun. Take the suhoor, because the suhoor is barakah. He said the difference between our fast and the fast of Bani Israel is the suhoor. Those people, Alul Kitab in them, they used to fast in Ramadan. Kutiba alaykum usiyamu, kama kutiba ala ladinim kablikum la'alakum tattaqoon. It was on them in Ramadan, but they didn't have suhoor. So rahmah. So you're eating that food, and it's a mundane issue. But because it's the suhoor of Ramadan, that food becomes qurba in Allah. Something you get close to Allah Azza wa Lastly, Ikhwani, this hadith enters into every single bab in Al-Islam. Every bab of ibadah, every bab of, of mu'amala, all of the mu'amalat in Al-Islam. This hadith, that's why Imam al-Shafi'i said, this hadith enters into 70, 70, 70 babs of fiqh. He didn't mean 70, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 70. What he meant was 70 as a large number. 70 as a large number. He didn't mean 70, 70. Allah said in the Quran about the munafiqeen, وَإِن تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً لَنْ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ If you ask Allah to forgive them 70 times, Allah won't forgive them. It didn't mean 70. I mean, if you ask Allah, Allah won't forgive them. So this particular hadith enters into every bad in Al-Islam. Aqidah. This hadith goes to show Al-Iman, the niyyah. The niyyah is from Al-Iman. The niyyah is from Al-Iman. And that's why Imam al-Bukhari put this hadith inside al-Bukhari in the chapter of Al-Iman. He put this hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ In the chapter of Al-Iman. Because Ahlul Sunnah, Al-Iman is what you believe in your heart. What your niyat is and what you believe. It's the actions on your limbs. And it's your profession of that with your tongue. So this is a general quick synopsis of this hadith. There are many <coughs> things that can be mentioned about this hadith that can be really heavy and difficult, but that's not the goal the objective of this class. This class is a class of instruction, a class of irshad and toji. Don't go away here not knowing the importance of cultivating your niyyah, developing your niyyah, working to have a pure, clean niyyah for Allah Ta'ala. تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عمل Allah said he's the one who created life and death in order to test all of you to see أيكم أحسن عمل which one of you has the best deeds it didn't say it didn't say it didn't say the most deeds, the best deeds, the one who fasts the month of Ramadan and the one who gives the most food in Ramadan and the one who gives the most money in Ramadan, the one who prayed the most taraweeh in Ramadan and read the most Quran in Ramadan may not necessarily be the best one to come out of Ramadan. The best one may be a person who did far lesser than him or her. But when they did what they did, it was with ikhlas, it was for Allah. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ He was only, they were only commanded 
Worship Allah alone with ikhlas. Do it for Allah and make sure that it's done in the proper way the Prophet wasallam showed us. Nia. And in ending, and in ending, I'd like to remind you that the Nabi of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now that Ramadan is coming, he said, tamratin fear the hellfire even if it's with half of a date. Even if it's with half of a date. The lady came to the house of Aisha radiallahu anha and she said, I need some food. I have these two daughters. Aisha said, okay, hold on. She went in, she looked for the food. She came out with one date. That's all she had in her house. Just one date. Can you imagine that? Everybody here has more than that in this house. She came out with one date. She gave it to the lady. The lady took the date and split it in half. Gave it to one of the daughters on the right and the one on the left. And didn't take anything for herself. And that is the sacrifice of the mother. The sacrifice of our mothers. The sacrifice of our women, our wives. They were sacrificed like that. It's the fitrah. What mother in her right mind is going to eat the date and leave the kids like that? She's going to give the two kids the date. The lady left. When the prophet came home, Aisha told him about it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah told, father, uh, told Aisha, that date that you gave to that lady, and she split it in half, he said that that date will be a hijab. It will be a hijab for the mother from the hellfire. And it will be a hijab for you from the hellfire. One date split in half is a hijab for two people. For two people. Because the niya is for Allah. And the action is according to Al-Islam. And you will be rewarded comparable to the efforts that you're doing. For Aisha to give, that's all she had. She said in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, two, three months will pass by. Two, three new hilals. The ahilla will come and go. And all we had to eat were the two black things. Dates and water in the black cup. So all she has is one date. So it takes a lot to give that one date because she's hungry too. She gave the one date. The mother, one date. It's difficult to give that date. She gave it. So you will be rewarded comparable to the difficulty. So don't look at anything as being insignificant. With the proper niya, Allah can make that thing extremely big and extremely large. Okay, Akhwati, if you brothers have any questions in relationship to today's daras, today's hadith, and we're finished with that hadith, and we're going to suspend the class, inshallah, until after the jum, after the the the, uh, the um, Ramadan. So the first Sunday after Ramadan, inshallah, we'll resume the class. Fadl Yahi Ibrahim al Ben. If like, his intention is not for the deen, once it, once it starts. That's old Perrier water, man. <laughs> they need even water. That's old Perrier water. If somebody start, does an action and his intention is not there to begin with, but then whilst he's doing the action, he says that I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, would he still get the same reward? Now, if someone does an action and he didn't have the intention at first, and then he made that intention in the process of doing the action, would he get his reward? Now, because the hadith said, إِنَّمَ الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ And the hadith didn't say in the beginning of the action or the middle of the action or before he starts the action, or after he starts the action. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kareem, and Allah azza wa jal, is rahmah, is wasi'ah, ila akhiri. So inshallah, provided he has the right knee, no problem. Last week we also mentioned, ikhwani, didn't see the need to really go deep into this this week, but the place of the niya is in the heart. So we do not make this niya on our tongue, I intend to make salat, and so forth and so on. Shukran, good sister. I intend this, I intend that. The ulama of Islam, some of them spoke very strongly against this position that is in some of the madahib that some of the people teach. Before you pray, you have to say, I intend to pray this prayer behind this imam and so forth and so on. And imam al-Shawkani, imam al-Qayyim, these imams, 
They used to write hard against this issue. And they used to say, if a person does something like this, then it is a bidah. It's a bidah. And if a person does it, and he's making this niyat out loud, bothering the people, then it's masia. It's just, first it's a bidah within himself. But if he does it, and he's bothering the people, he's saying out loud, I intend to make this salah. And he's bothering. He said, with the ittifa of all of the ulama, this is masia. Because there's nothing established for you to be reading out like that anyway. They said if he's doing it in order to show off, then he fell into shirk. It's no khayr in this thing. No dalil. Some of the ulama said, anyone who says this is from al-Islam, he's fell into a kabira from the kabayr. It's no dalil. So if a person wants to pray, he doesn't make this niyan. He wants to do wudu, he doesn't have to make this niyan. He wants to invite people, he doesn't say, I'm going to make this fool with a niyan. No. Your niyan is in your heart. It's already known. Whoever made that fool, whoever brought that fool, the niyan of doing that was for the mischief. So look, this brother said, okay, a person, he did a deed and he didn't have the niyan. He made some food. I have an akik, I have a party, a wanima. So we eat that food. And there's some rice and food left over. I didn't make it for the masjid. I made it for the walima. So my niyyah wasn't to make this food for the masjid. But now there's an opportunity. Now I'm going to send this food to the masjid that's left over. So this is a new niyyah. You get rewarded for that niyyah. <inaudible> Your deeds are judged by the niyyah. But the niyyah is in the heart. With the exception again of the talbiyah, which we don't even call it a niyyah. The talbiyah, the bayka lahumma the bayk. The bayka lahumma al hajj. This is the talbiyah. You brothers have any more questions? Yes. Fadda ya akhi. Shaykh, I just want to ask a question about myself. There is a... Fadda. There is a guy, there is a friend, he's a Christian. He asked me something yesterday. He said they are looking for a, a house to rent to make it as a church. He said because I'm a taxi driver, I drive around. If I see one, if I can able to tell them. So if I see a place where they can rent for a church, I go and tell him, I say this place, you can rent this for a church. If they rent it, I'm gonna go <coughs> see for that or I've got reward for that. In this case you shouldn't advise and help people in issues like that. Okay. If you can help it, <coughs> don't help people in issues like that. The hadith said, Adalu ala khair The one who guides something to good, he will get the reward of it. So you have to guide the person to good. In this case, you're guiding them to shirk and kufr and how to disobey Allah Azza wa And the other hadith comes in, Man sunnah fil islami sunnatin hasana kana lahu ajruha Anyone who does a good deed in Al Islam, he will get the reward of any and everyone who does that good deed after. Anyone who does a bad deed, he starts a bad deed in Al Islam. He will get the responsibility and the evil of the people who do it after, without their reward being decreased or without his their sins being decreased. So, if someone kills someone, Adam's son, who initiated murder, he'll get a reward of that. So, we don't help people and we don't guide people in that other than which will be considered good. But if a person is in a position of responsibility. And his responsibility necessitates and dictates that he helps them, then this is a different issue. Then this is a different issue. He's not responsible. For an example, the leader of the Muslims, the leader of the Muslims, he has non Muslims who are living under his authority. He's allowed to give them some land where they're going to worship. You can't compel people. So if they want, to, they want to worship and they have that land, you can't come and stop them from doing it. Meaning, Ya Muhammad, are you going to force the people to be Muslims? You can't force them. 
So the leader knows that that's their church. He knows that that's their school. You know, you can't come and knock that down. And you can't say he's helping evil to go forward. So a person who's in a position of authority is something different. If you're being forced by some authority, then this is different. But just to go to their church as the um, carpenter, and you're going to make their cross, and you're going to take the contract to build a church, la kella. You can't do that. You're helping them to worship other than Allah Azza wa Jalla. Is it permissible to return to the original home after performing Hijra? Is it permissible for the person to return to the original home where he made hijra from? Allahumma na'am. He can return to where he came from if the reasons that caused him to make hijra, if they uzilet, they were lifted up and eradicated, and they are not there anymore. Fear, he can't worship his Lord, can't practice his religion. If those things are removed out of the equation, it's permissible for him to return to his home, as some of the companions did. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he went back to Mecca after the Hijrah, after the death of the Prophet he went back to Mecca. And other ulama, other Muslims from the companions went back to Mecca. Well, there was two questions, now it's the third based on what the brother asked. Because I've heard from the Shaykh al-Albani that the Sahabas were not allowed to go back to Mecca. And this is why when one of the Sahaba died in Mecca, the Prophet said a statement which I can't remember, but it means that it's not good. Because they left everything for the sake of Allah and they are not allowed to go back to that place. Yeah, as I mentioned, after the death of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Mecca became Darul Islam. <coughs> so some of the companions went back to Islam, back to Mecca. After this, Me Mecca brings Islam, they became Muslims. And the Muslims were allowed now to make Umrah, to make Hajj. And they went there and they lived there. And they continued to go to Mecca until today. Yeah, but they were not allowed to stay as to leave Medina and make his residence in Mecca. Now, as I mentioned, clearly Abdullah ibn Abbas went back to Mecca. And then in the end part of his life, he moved out of Mecca towards the area of Ta'if because he felt being in Mecca was a great responsibility for the sins in Mecca. Like if you do the ibadat there, they are heightened. If you do the ibadat there, they are heightened and also the rewards as well. But what we can do is, inshallah, we can brush up on this particular mas'ala to bring some of the aqwal of the ulama al fuqaha. Last question. I still have to. How can we balance between the hadith which you have mentioned about I'm free from those who live among the mushrikeen. And there's another hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Al Muslim wal kafru la tatara'ana ruhuma fi dunya. So they, there should be a distance even in the place where you live between a Muslim and the kafir. This hadith is actually the addition or the other part of the hadith, Ana bari'un min kulli Muslim. يقيموا بين أظهر المشركين لا تتراءى نارهما. I'm free from every Muslim that chooses to live with the mushrikeen because their two lights, their two fires, do not coexist. Their two fires don't coexist, can't coexist. Meaning, if the Muslim is living with the non-Muslim in the non-Muslim environment then their fire and their way of life is going to affect that Muslim. And if the non-Muslim is living in the Muslim's environment, then the Muslim environment, that fire is going to affect the non-Muslim. So him living with the Muslims is going to get benefit. It's going to be less crime. It's going to be less fahisha. It's going to be less problems. Whereas if the Muslim is living with him, everything that is counterproductive, diametrically opposed to the Muslim's way of life, he's going to be affected by that. The munkarat are going to kill his heart because the more you're around munkar, the more you embrace it, the more you accept it. So that hadith is part of the same hadith. And the way we understand the hadith is that the hadith itself is not contradicting the first part, the second part. It's not like a hadith contradicting another. It's the same hadith and it's not contradicting. And as I mentioned, it's talking about, it's talking about the Muslim who cannot practice his religion. 
the Muslim who can practice his religion, and as a result of being in that condition, his Islam is being his Islam is being uh, compromised. He doesn't pray. He can't make Juma. He can't he can't uh, uh, show his Islam. He has to cut his beard. He has to change his name. His wife can't wear hijab. All of those issues that make him low and, and, and small, he has to do all of that stuff. Whereas Al-Islam is telling him not to be like that. Islam is telling him, Al-Islam ya'ala, when ayu'ala alayhi, Islam is uppermost, nothing should be over Islam. Nothing should be over Islam. In Spain, the non-Muslims of Spain, the Crusaders, they used to kill the Muslims for being Muslims. So the Muslims stopped changing their names. The Muslims stopped practicing their religion. They stopped going to the masjid. It got so bad that they gave up everything that would show that they were Muslim except one thing that they could conceal and that was their circumcision. The hatred that the crusaders had for them was so great and intense that they would say, come and show us your private part. Show it to us right now. And then if they saw his private part, he had a chitan, he had a circumcision, they would kill him because that's all they held on to. I got a circumcision, that's it. But I eat pork. My name is George. My name is everything about me. You can't tell that I'm a Muslim. The Prophet said, I'm free from that individual. I'm free from that guy, that individual. Or the one who, during the time of Mecca and Medina, when he first made Hijra, and those ayahs were telling the people, come and make Hijra to strengthen the community, and they wouldn't do it, he was free from those people when they were killed when the kuffar transgressed against them. And Allah is a'la and a'la. Last question, Ikhwani, from one of the sisters. She is saying, Barakallah fiha, I am waking, I am working a full time. Uh, I'm working full time. And as a mother of four, alhamdulillah, I'm using this money to cover all my expenses for me and my family, from rent, water, food, clothing, everything. My husband has been living with us, claiming he has no money, and narrowing his job, his job search scope. In a nutshell, he is refusing to look for work or pay for anything except a specific job abroad for a specific salary. Does he need to repay all these expenses to me? And what's his Islamic stance about this matter? Concerning uh, paying the lady back for the sign that she's given to her husband, if they didn't make any agreement, if there's no payback, just as the husband... He's not and he shouldn't expect to be paid back by his wife because in that case it's wajib upon him to take care of her. Rijabu kawamuna ala nisa bima anfaku min amwali. So the man has to pay for the woman and never expect anything in return. The woman doesn't have to pay for the man. So if they have a, an agreement, why you're not working? I'm going to pay the rent, this, that, but you got to pay me back. And if he agrees to that, that's permissible. The believers have to take care of their contracts. Take care of your contracts and agreements. Especially the ones with your wives and with your husbands. The agreements that you have to take more care of more than any other agreement is the ones you make in your marriage, the ones that allow the private parts to become halal. So if she said, don't get married again, he agreed, you got to do that. If she said, give me the dowry of a thousand dollars, he has to do that, things like that, unless she lets him go. So in this case, if the husband made an agreement with the lady, then he has to pay her back. But if he didn't make that agreement, then no, he doesn't have to pay her back. As for this condition, this is not a good condition if the brother is being lazy or he's not having fiqh of the issue. If he's not being lazy, if he's not being, if he's being lazy, this is not a good thing. Because it's the opposite way. It's like the daytime, Allah created the daytime for us to live and seek our sustenance. And he made the nighttime to go to sleep. So if anyone is working in the night and sleeping in the day, that's going to affect him. Because it goes against the fitrah and the natural order of things. It's not haram. But there is a problem. The equilibrium has been mixed up. Taking the sunnah, it's bid'ah, bid'ah, sunnah, it's a problem. So in this case, 
this is not something that is okay. The other thing is, it's not okay if the man doesn't realize that, you know, from the fifth, I am not going to work until I get a specific job. And in the meantime, in between time, we're going to starve to death. Or in the meantime, in between time, my wife is going to do all of the work. And what comes from that? Being out of the house, not being able to take care of the kids, not being able to keep up with the kids, not being able to do hot and bad, all that stuff like that. Then it's not a, it's not a, a good thing for the individual to do. He has to have some fit in the issue. Maybe that his wife has to carry him at some point. That's what Allah said in the Quran. These are the days we change them with the people. One day you win, one day you lose. One day you call, one day you hop. One day you got money, next day you don't got money. One day you're working, next day you're not working. One day you take care of the family, next day your wife is helping you out. It goes back and forth like that. No one is always going to be on one single plane. So if that happened, no problem. As for saying, no, I'm only going to work if... I get one job, specific job, in a particular country, paying for a particular, then this is not the fiqh. This is not correct fiqh, this is fiqh saqeem. Like the man, uh, what's his name? Khufayn uh, Hunayn. Khufayn Hunayn. This is, he didn't have any fiqh. Khufayn Hunayn. He's like a fictitious character. He's not fictitious, but he's a character from the Arab uh, uh, culture. A man who was traveling, and when he was traveling in the desert, he saw a hoof, the leather sock, but it was only one. And he said, man, that's a nice looking hoof. But he didn't get off of his camel. He kept walking, he kept traveling. Way down there, he found the second one. He said, oh, the second one. This one must belong to the other one. Let me go back and get that other one. And he went back to get the other one, and it's gone. And then he said, well, maybe he went up, and the second one is gone. So they missed two opportunities. They call him Khufayn Hunayn. His name was Hunayn, and those are Khufayn, two hooks. So you say that when someone does something like that, he, he misses an opportunity, and then he comes back with nothing. You say, man, you Khufayn Hunayn, man. You, you're waiting to get a job in Mecca, so you can notice this example. You're waiting to get a job in Mecca, making 80,000 pounds a year until you get that, you're not going to work. So you lose your wife and your kids, got divorced, and you never went to Mecca. You Hufayn Hunayn. No, I'm not talking about that brother. I'm talking about this is how, this is how the, um, that fit is. So we ask Elijah Joe to uh, help the situation. And I think we need to be careful more about these kind of questions a little bit. Because we don't want people to be sensitive and things like that. Someone may know someone got four kids. There's more than one person got four kids, but someone's going to be thinking, is it him? Is it him? Is it him? <laughs> so we should avoid these kind of questions. And Allah is Allah and Allah. So good job, Ikhwan, inshallah. That's the first hadith. We have, inshallah, 49 more to go. Be ibn Allah ta'ala. To go little by little. Make sure you make your niyyah correct in the month of Ramadan because there is a lot of actions in Ramadan for zakat, for sadaqah, for the khutbah, for dawah. Uh, so many issues coming into the masjid, praying the way you pray, and all of these issues. Seven people will be shaded under Allah's shade of the throne, Yom Qiyamah. One of them is the man who gave sadaqah to the point where the left hand didn't know what the right hand gave. He was that secretive that he gave sadaqah, nobody knew what he was giving. His wife didn't even know what he was doing. So we make that kind of jihad. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.